Today, we are going to talk about when do you know it's your time to become a professional artist? You paint your abstracts, you do commission work, you have collectors. Yeah. She kind of looks like me. She sounds like me. There's always something to do with art. <gasps> I love the smell of oil paint. If you don't look like that, then you must not be an artist. Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of The Light Movement Show, where we talk about everything artists need to know about becoming a professional artist and how to navigate your creative journey. So we are here with uh, Casey Wakefield. You are a professional artist. Mm -hmm. You live in Arizona. Mm -hmm. That's where we met yeah. through the mastery program. And actually you took a few classes mm -hmm. before you signed up for the mastery program yeah. from me. And so I was just thinking like, what on earth does a person think? Like, did you think I was like super like hardcore and down to business or were you in a class where I was like, you know, really nice and fluffy? Do mm -hmm. you even remember? I remember walking in and be like, oh, I love the smell of oil paint. And then I'd come in and then just be like excited about what are we going to do today? And then I'm excited when you would come in and be like, oh, hey, that's what we're going to do. And then we, or we just talk about, sometimes we could get you talking, you know, it's kind of like the kids, <laughs> you know, they talk, we, we got our talk, our teacher talking today, so we didn't have to take our test or something like that, you know? Oh, that's funny. But I always thought it was fun just kind of talking, you know, everyone just chit-chatting, finding out about their day or what was going on in their family or their kids or their new idea that they had, like, what if I painted this or what if I did that? Just everyone's kind of thoughts about different things or questions. And I just remember feeling like, okay, this is fun. There's always something relatable, know, relatable or... something that we're always talking about or like making me think more or think higher or think creatively or, mm, that's you good. know, or possibilities. And it just, I always felt whenever I came in there, I was just, I knew I was always going to be hopeful about something. So, and excited about something and leave with something good. So that's what I remember about the mastery program. Well, when you first signed up for the mastery program, mm -hmm. did you know that you wanted to be a professional artist or were you just kind of like, I'll see if this goes somewhere? I was very excited. I knew it was something if I didn't do it, I would regret it for the rest of my life. And I just felt like this need to create. And I thought, I don't know, we'll see if I can really do that or if I ha I'm not that creative. So I don't know, but I feel safe. I feel like I could at least, I know I can learn things. I'm a lifelong learner. This will be a learning experience and we'll just see what happens and go with it. But, you know, I'm excited about the, po I was excited about the possibility of knowing what I should be doing. And so, but to me, that whole time through the program, I was just kind of in awe. You know, I was just always kind of watching, observing, listening, and just in all that I was actually having that experience to be able to draw and paint and just be creative. Mm, that's super cool. Mm -hmm. Do you remember by any chance when your identity shifted and you were able to think of yourself, one, as an artist, and then number two, as a professional artist? I think the time, I would say like part three of the program in the sense of when we we're just um, starting maybe portfolio. Even part two. Well, it, it was more of like the archetypes and the disc analysis and really getting to know yourself even more was where I recognized and realized, oh, like this all makes sense. Like finally something just everything about it made sense to me and felt inherently like true. And so I feel like that was when I was like, okay, yeah, I think I could really work with this. And then the other part with portfolio, and I didn't ever come up with, or I would have like pictures or whatever that I'd want to paint or, but not really. And so I would just bring a picture or grab whatever, just so I would be painting. And then we'd done a lesson on abstracts. And I was like, Ellie, I was probably like whiny, like, I don't know what to paint. You're like, just paint, you know, like paint an abstract then or something, you know? And I was like, oh, I can like, oh, good. Cause that's what I, I love abstracts. And so I thought, well, but then how do I even go about how do I even plan an abstract painting, you know, or how do I even get to that point, especially when I'm someone that's not that expressive. So going through that part too, then that's when another part that started resonating with me that, okay, I really like this. I could see myself doing this mm. a lot, you know. That's cool. Did you sell any artwork or have a commission or or anything like that throughout the mastery program? During the program, I had one commission. 
Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And I didn't even, and they were friends of ours that live back in Chicago. And I was like, I, it totally surprised me. Like, I didn't know that they would have been interested in art, you know, or would trust me to like paint them a painting, you know. And but you weren't even trying to sell your art at that no, point. No, because I was like, I, you know, it was towards the end where I even like posted on my personal Facebook. And another one of the students took a, like, took a picture of me, like pretending to paint one of my paintings, you know, <laughs> like an action shot kind of a thing. And, and, um. And then, so I finally was like, well, if I'm going to do this, I've got to put something out there. And so I did it on my personal, like Facebook and Instagram account and everything. And then I may have like started my own, you know, Casey Wakefield Instagram account. But of course I still had to have art on it. I couldn't just be Casey Wakefield, the artist kind of thing too. You know, it's still me separating the two things. And now I'm like, well, I don't even want to like blend them together now because I've got who I follow and my followers on that. That'd be kind of confusing. I don't, you know, so I don't know. But yeah, it was kind of funny to where I even just had to have that as Casey Wakefield art, just in case, just in case. (laughs) Yeah. 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 (laughs) So you did a commission Mm -hmm. and they were happy with it? Oh, yeah. They were happy about it. How did that make you feel? Did that like gel the whole identity of being able to be an an artist and professional artist? It did because then I thought too, like, well, I've got to keep this going so that their painting is worth something. Yeah. Now you owe them. I know. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, they paid me for it. I was prepared and how to communicate because we'd already gotten to that point within the program too. But also if I wasn't, I knew I could come to you and be like, what should I say? What do I need to do? How do I do this? But I was already prepared knowing that, okay, you give them a price and this is how you price your artwork and this is how you can communicate, make sure they're clear, you know, communication is clear of what they want, what you are going to give them. And then doing, you know, like, how do you say it? Kind of like over, under sell, over deliver, you know, mm-hmm, is what mm-hmm. I was thinking like, oh, it's going to take six weeks. But, and then I was thinking, okay, I could really get it done in four weeks and get it shipped to them. And, you know, the paint would dry by then and all that stuff. And so then that made them feel good. Like I was a responsible artist. I wasn't somebody who was flaky and like, oh, I'll get it to you. You in like did three all months. the stuff right. I know. I did everything you told me to do. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it gave me a boost of confidence and it helped. And it just kept me wanting to keep going because I wanted to be ready and feel comfortable to be able to paint another commission anytime soon, too. So it's the more I was felt comfortable with my materials than the more I felt like I could keep painting something for other people and in general. So yeah, I remember at some point in the program before you had fully shifted into like, I want to make abstracts, Mm -hmm. you were making basically an abstract painting and then you were kind of sticking a bird on it. Do you remember that? think so it might have it might have been maybe yeah like a hummingbird and it was I might have been in the mixed media part Mm -hmm. and I even remember where you were standing you were over by where the air can where you'd put the air conditioner on or off over on that side yeah and and you were at the end of it trying to figure out if it was done or not and you had charcoal and I think we just were talking about it and you had said that you really liked the abstract part Mm. but how to like make the bird work wasn't you know, Mm -hmm. and it might've been that day. I might've remembering it wrong, but at some point we were like, well, why don't you just do abstracts? Mm -hmm. And it was almost like, felt like you were like, I can do that. Like it's actual real art. If I just do the abstracts, Mm -hmm. what do you remember about that? Was it, did you have this predisposed idea that like, it's too easy or it's too, I don't know, something you know, like art wise, I always thought you need to represent or you need to replicate something. And then that shows that you're a good artist, something realistic looking and everything and not necessarily be as expressive. But as I went through the program, I learned the more expressive I am, that's even better art. And the more unique I am into my own, you know, painting my own process, my own voice, As if I could get that into my artwork, then I knew that would be good art. And so when you said that, that gave me like so much freedom because then I thought, oh my gosh, I love abstract paintings. I didn't know necessarily, and I wasn't an expressive person either. So or that much at that time. And so I thought, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'll figure it out. And so then when you said that, I I went back and I was like, why do people even like create abstract paintings? And so that sent me into my research mode, you know, yeah, (laughs) that I go into and do. And you had those ladies with the hats that were going to inspire you. I remember that. yeah. Yeah. And the color palettes. And then you tapped into how color was really important Mm -hmm. to you. Was color really important to you before? Mm -hmm. You know, neutral things and neutral colors, I thought, were, like, very, 
I thought those were more sophisticated and calm and just made me feel good. But then the more I learned to use different colors and the contrast and the overall composition of putting colors together and how that can make you feel. And now I like, well, I can imagine not living with color or bold colors or, you know, just different ways to use color and all the, I mean, many combin infinite amount of combinations of color that you can put together. There's always something to make and always something to create. I don't run out of ideas with um, abstracts. So. Okay. And then share with everybody a little bit about your family. So I married my high school sweetheart. We knew each other growing up and grew up in a small town in Illinois in the middle of, you know, nowhere, basically. Yeah, we dated throughout high school and then off, on and off in college. And then after college, we decided or we had our first kid. So he's 21. And then we have an 18. Oh, wow. Yeah, I know. I can't believe it. <laughs> so, but it's fun, though, you know. And so, and then an 18-year-old daughter and a 15-year-old daughter. And so we lived in Arizona for the six, first six years of our life and then two years in California after that, then went back to Illinois thinking, oh, it'd be great to raise the kids back home close to family and everything. But cloudy winters and cold winters just kind of got to us both a little bit. And we're like, all right. We knew we wanted to be back in Arizona eventually. We just didn't think it would be that early. And so when our oldest was in seventh grade, we're like, it's now or never. So let's go. So yeah, we moved back to Arizona. and So you guys moved like around. There. It sounds like a you moved bit. around a lot. Yeah. So what was, what was, um, what was the reason for that? So at the time, right out of high school, my husband in college, he played football for college. His size and his speed at that time, you know, like in high school got him recognized and everything. And he was, you know, got good grades. And, and so the University of Illinois recognized that. And, you know, he probably wasn't like one of their top picks to, you know, give a scholarship to at the time, but they knew he was a good kid. And so they signed him on as a full ride scholarship. And so that was a great opportunity for him. And the more he got going and, you know, he worked really hard through college. It wasn't something that came super easy to him, but he had some gifts to him, you know, on his side. And then he had some great games in college and everything and got more recognition from NFL scouts. And so one thing led to another and he wasn't drafted his rookie year, but the Arizona Cardinals took him as a free agent and he worked hard, really hard through that camp and earned a spot on the team. So that's why we were in Arizona for for the first six years. And then after that with the Oakland Raiders for two years, that's why we ended up in California. So, and that was a great experience. But yet at the same time, that first year we were there, I remember the kids and I were going to fly out there to be with them for that season. After this experience in Arizona, we moved everything back to Illinois and then kept some things to take with us to wherever he, we didn't know where he would end up after mm. the Cardinals. And so it's one of those things. And I, that, I wasn't good with that. Like, not knowing what would be next, you mm -hmm. know, and it was like, oh, it was so much anxiety, you know. But then I do remember, you know, the kids and I, we were going to be coming out once he got done with camp. And I had never lived in Northern California, so I didn't even know where we were going to be living. He had already picked out the place, got things moved in, everything settled for us. And we were going to be coming on that Saturday. And I got a call, I think, on a Monday or Tuesday. And he's like, hey, I tore my ACL. He didn't have surgery. The next day it was two days after that. Meanwhile, we have our son was five going into kindergarten. Our daughter, middle daughter was three going into pre starting preschool for the first time. And then our youngest was just only six weeks old and born. I remember thinking, oh, okay, uh, how are we going to do this? So thank goodness my mom was going to fly out with us on that Saturday too, because me and three little kids on a long flight to from Chicago to California was kind of hectic. You know, I could do it, but... <laughs> That was going to be nuts. So anyways, I was nursing the baby at the time. So we went ahead and went out there and so and helped him with his surgery and everything. And so that was a very overwhelming time. But at the same time, all you can do is keep stake, taking one step in front of the other and just doing the best you can. And so, and it was a lonely time when I didn't know anybody out there, you know? And so, but at the same time, it was a, it's a beautiful area and we just made the most of what we had at that time and, and did it. And you just kind of go with the flow with the opportunities you have, you know, mm -hmm. and I feel like that time period or those years carried with us and after, you know, his football career in the sense of, you know, just being ready for the moments that you're given or those opportunities and doing the best you can with it and then and then moving on. Don't hold on to it. Don't, you know, dwell about what you could have or couldn't have done or shouldn't have done or anything like that. Just do your best you can and just keep doing. But also do the things that you that inspire you and that the desire that you have to do because you don't know if you, that opportunity will come again. So mm -hmm. 
did you go to a lot of his games? Even though you had young kids, I imagine you couldn't go to yeah. all of them. But did you go to a lot of them and yeah, the, were kind of like his cheerleader? And Well, I mean, the um, home games we would go to, my oldest and I, I took him everywhere with me. And so we always had a routine, get to our seats or get a hot dog and, you know, our licorice rope and, you know, and soda or whatever and go and sit in our seats. And that's what we did. And then we would just go home, you know, go out to dinner um, after the games and everything. And then as the kids got a little bit older, we'd get a babysitter for them. And so they wouldn't have to, to them, they could, they didn't get it. They didn't realize dad was really out there or what he was doing or could care less, you know. Mm -hmm. So it was always, they were just playing with whatever toys that we could smuggle into the stadium and sit there and play with them. And that was it. They'd rather be home with other friends with the babysitter playing. So, yeah. Basically, in the early years, I mean, your husband had a lot of limelight on him mm -hmm. and, you know, it was, it was his career yeah. and you were definitely the support. And now he's in business yeah. and does business consulting and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And then at some point when you decided to become an artist, now you're sort of stepping into a role where you do your gallery shows, mm -hmm. you know, you're the one dressed up. He's the you know, trophy husband yeah. on your <laughs> side, <Yeah>. right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's you that's all gussied up, you know, yeah. and and it's people coming to talk to you. Mm -hmm. How's that been? Because no, it is a shift yeah. and it's interesting. I think it's interesting. Yeah. He loves it. He thinks it's great. And he loves that there's something that I'm passionate about that I love to do, you know, and he's super supportive about it. And it is one of those things. And we've talked about it too. Like, And I think with, if you can realize this too, within relationships or marriages, like there's always a time and a season for things. If I had the football career or that sports career at that young, uh, that opportunity, I would hope my family or the people around me closest to me would be most supportive possible, you know, and not, not allow me to do that or get in the way of that. And so if I wanted that, then I should give it, you know? And so I felt like I was as supportive as I could be possible, you know, and whether it was changing the food or the diet that we had within the home and I would forget for a while in the beginning, be like, oh, let's go for some ice cream. And he'd be like, ah, oh, no, I can't have ice cream or, you know, things like that. And so it's just kind of being supportive of where they're at and trying to help them within their environment too. And so then whenever I did start, you know, spending more time out in the studio and creating, then he was like, oh, okay. Like I, I would explain, it's just like any other profession or any other business. You got to put time into it. So you actually have something to give, you know, or something to sell. And so then that was helpful, like super respectful of the time when I'm out in the studio, you know, we're always looking at each other's weeks, what's going on, trying to figure out, you know, dinner, you know, who's going to make dinner tonight, who's running to the store or vice versa. We're not the best at it all the time, but you know, like, you know, there's times where if it is super busy that week, then we, we can figure it out. But, you know, I think that if you're willing to be able to give and take, you know, sometimes it not may not be all about you. Maybe it might be trying to balance each other's things out, or maybe sometimes it is all about the, that other person and being their support system. System. And just realizing that, you know, there's everything all is in seasons. It's not, you know, just because you're giving more time in this moment doesn't mean it's always going to be like that, you know. And so I think recognizing that and being able to work through that is a very respectful thing for each other to be able to navigate. Mm -hmm. What about with your children? You know, they, they're also into sports mm -hmm. and they all, you know, went through high school. You still have one still in high school. Yeah. And there's a bit of Fred's business. Mm -hmm. You you have to, you know, kind of take turns who's taking them to games and yeah. who's taking them to school and who's, have your kids been able to be supportive of your career mm -hmm. and realize sometimes they got to drive with a friend or something? Yeah. Or Yeah. No, they're super supportive and they enjoy it too and think, think it's fun and they're respectful of my time went out in the studio you know they they're welcome to pop in anytime too but you know they're always like mom are you out there or can I come out or hey do you have a minute kind of a thing you know and so that you know and whatever they have going on I plan my time around what they have going on because they're only there for this you know small part of time and it things go quick you know it's yeah. like everybody says oh it goes so quick and yeah and it does you know you get to a point where you're going and you're busy and it's just you go, go, go. And I try to be present within the moments and take them. I want to be there. That's the whole point of even me being able to have my studio at home is so that I can come and go and still be in all those moments with them too. So, but we do, we share like if, you know, Fred's got a meeting somewhere, or if he's out of town, then I'm not, you know, I'm ready to go. I'll adjust my schedule and time. Maybe I won't get that much time in to my painting that week, but you know, that's okay. Next week I'll really ramp it up even more, or I could be 
be doing other things. I could be reading something that would help my growth and help within my, but there's always something to do with art. It's not, even if you're not physically painting or drawing, you know? So I feel like there's never time wasted really. So Mm -hmm. I feel like too, your story is, I know there's probably been times where you've thought like, ah, my story's kind of you know, boring and there's nothing really that inspiring about it. Normal. But I think the fact that, you know, you as a normal person are pursuing art and Mm -hmm. you've taken that courageous step and you've stepped into it and you're succeeding and you're, you know, walking Mm -hmm. out the whole professional artist role and doing it well. And, and you have, you know, plans in your future Mm -hmm. for even more. I think there's people that might be watching that can I really identify with you, even just like look wise a lot Mm -hmm. of us when we look at other people we begin to identify like yeah she kind of looks like me she sounds like me you know I've had teenage kids or I have a husband and I we have to balance give and Mm -hmm. take back and forth there's so many people think of artists as this like shaved head blue hair you know black clothes and black eyeliner and you know yeah and and if you don't look like that then you must not be an artist. Mm -hmm. Did you ever sort of have those feelings or like, wow, I'm too, you know, suburban volleyball mom for (laughs) for this role? Well, yeah. I mean, even when I was younger and in college, I remember taking an art history class, just kind of putting my toe in the water a little bit. And, but you know, I didn't relate or recognize, I didn't see the general, you know, students, I didn't fit into that, you know, mold or whatever. And so, or that idea, and I wasn't that expressive. I didn't, because I didn't want to be seen. I, I wanted to do the act of creating. I just didn't need to be seen, you know. But then, yeah, even so, like to this day, if I do go to different events or whatever, I think, well, I didn't start out as, I didn't have those, the guts to start out as an artist as a young age. Am I really a true artist? Because I didn't really act on it back then. You know, I find maybe my collectors might find it relatable because there are similarities and things or, or just maybe, but it's really more about like your thoughts and your feelings and your emotions that I think you put in your art and what you stand for is what people relate to and not Mm -hmm. necessarily like how I look. Let's face it. Every artist struggles with that. Am I real artist? Yeah. As if there's some standard out there Mm -hmm. of real artist and some qualities there and like, you know, what is that? Yeah, I think that's something everybody struggles with. Mm -hmm. You know, I've always been really good at math. You know, I loved history and I was very academic Mm -hmm. and I, you know, was a straight A student. Were you like class president too or something? I was class president. I I was like, you know, this overachiever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And all the artists were usually the kids that, well, like my husband, Mm -hmm. you know, that (laughs) that weren't good at school, misunderstood, Mm -hmm. sort of a misfit in a way, a round peg in a square hole. And I was like, I am a square peg in a square hole and I like it. I'm <laughs> yeah. like, I function really well here. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I was always a little bit funky and I enjoyed like a funky look. Mm-hmm. I didn't fit the mold, your typical artist. And so I always wonder too, am I a real artist? Yeah. And I also know that I never had any really like innate talent. Everything I can do, I learned. Mm-hmm. So I think a lot of artists struggle with that. And even artists that are a round peg and a square hole, you know, have maybe struggled with, am I a real artist? Mm-hmm. So I would say if you guys, that resonates with you, we'd love to hear in the comments, yeah. have you questioned or wondered, and maybe you're even wondering right now, am I a real artist? And we would say the answer mm. is absolutely yes. If your yeah. passion is for art and it's it's really what you love to do, mm-hmm. no matter what your story is, what you look like or what your background is or where you come from, you are a real artist, I would say so. And I remember you saying that or that you had to work hard or that you practice drawing and you pa- practice painting and things like that. And so then I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I guess the more I practice, the better I'll be. And there, there are tools to use to be able to see things and to, you know, and to draw. And, you know, there's ways to learn about going about your creativity and, and expressing yourself. So, yeah, that was helpful. So I know you read a lot of books and you've said that you really love biographies and mm-hmm. seeing, you know, lives and and memoirs. You love memoirs. Mm-hmm. So if you were to ever write a memoir, well, first of all, oh, do you gosh. ever think you would? Um... You probably no, should. I don't know. No, you should. You know why? I, know why? I mean, if you love memoirs and you <laughs> that means you should write one. I don't know. I need to I need to work on the story worthy homework. So okay. I need to work on okay. to find more stories, I guess. 
<laughs> okay. So if you were hypothetically to write a memoir and you think about like your grandchildren or your mm. great grandchildren reading that, what would you want to be written in those pages? Like what would you want your legacy? I know you think about legacy because you read mm -hmm. those biographies and yeah. that's that's a big theme. What's most important to you in your, I know it's a deep question, but. Oh, I know deep thoughts. No, but as you were saying that, I immediately thought of like, I would want them to always pursue what they really love and desire to do and what makes them happy. Because if you work hard at something, then you'll figure it out. And it doesn't have to be a roadmap. It doesn't have to be, you know, a certain way to go about things. But if you work hard, you care about it, then you'll figure it out and things will happen for you. So... That's what I would hope that they would do. Yeah. And you're demonstrating that because like you said, there's a time and a season for things. Mm -hmm. And this doesn't mean that if people have small children yeah. and a husband who's an NFL player no. that they can't pursue their art. Definitely. It doesn't mean that. But it also can mean that there's a time in your life that you might choose to not you know, pursue mm -hmm. something because you've chosen to support and, you know, raise children and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. And you wanted to wholeheartedly do that yeah. and then take your, take the timing that you choose. Do you feel like looking back, you could have done it sooner or are you perfectly happy with the way it was? I mean, I could have done it sooner, I think, but it wouldn't have made as much of an impact if it wasn't been, I didn't come across anywhere of like tanking art lessons or painting lessons or anyone that was that passionate about art as you So were. you feel like things just didn't align, like maybe yeah, it wasn't divine destiny, and, yeah. it just wasn't your time. Right. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a good point, like for people to think about like, especially for women, mm -hmm. right? A lot of times the paradigm is that women are, you know, supporting their husband's mm -hmm. career and raising kids. And, and that's, you know, one of the roles women play. Because we hear people all the time that want to pursue mm -hmm. their art. And I did. I, I pursued art even though I had young children yeah. and built a business, you mm -hmm. know, with John. So it is a question of like, when, when is it good and when is it not? And I think that you made a good point about like, what is that quote when, um, the student is ready, the teacher will come, something like that. I think so, yeah. Yeah, and so it's like if if the things are sort of aligning on the outside, but you didn't have access, nothing was coming to you, nothing was working for you in terms of learning how mm -hmm. to do art until it was time. Yeah. And when you were ready, the teacher appeared. Yes, there yeah. you were. <laughs> yeah, tell everybody how you first... You were um, at an artist group or something and you How saw, I found out about yeah. Okay, so I think we'd been back in Arizona for like within a year. And so my thought was, I'll go to women's Bible study at my church that we'd been going to, and I'll meet some other women when, and just maybe find some connections that way. And and I was in that point where when we lived back in Illinois, I'd been volunteering and teaching quite a bit within my kids' school or just within the community. So it wasn't like I was set doing a specific career or anything like that. But when we got back out here or back to Arizona, we were both truly trying, because he was trying to figure something else out along the way. He had just finished his MBA at Illinois, and he was trying to figure out what he really wanted to do. And we had this time period of thinking, what do we really want to do? You know, we don't want to just be doing anything. We we both felt this inner desire or purpose to be doing desire, I guess, or destiny or purpose or something to be doing what we're doing now. We were doing a book and it was like a Michael Hyatt book, I think. And I don't remember what the title of it was, right? I think Living Forward, I think was the book mm. that we were both reading at that time. And it was helping us kind of navigate through these questions and thoughts and ideas. And I was like, one of the things that I wanted to do that I know, knew that would make me happy is I like art. I love art, you know, and I would like to learn how to maybe do something, you know, maybe take a class just to make, just to be a hobby or something that would be fun for me, an outlet. You know, but at that time I was like, but I'm really ready to like start doing something. All the kids are in school. We can figure this out, you know, time wise. And I went to that Bible study class and the woman's leader had her card on the table with her information. So if anyone wanted to reach out to her that we could. And on the other side of it was Demetra's art. And she said, oh, and by the way, you know, the art on the back of the card is painted by a young girl named Demetra Milan. I was like, oh my gosh, how cool. That's so beautiful. And so I just admired it. So I looked it up online and then there was like a blog post, I think on your guys' website or something. And, and it said something to the fact of, oh, it was something that we could all become artists or that idea of like we could learn how to do it and, and things like that. And so, so that caught my eye. And then really the first class was I took my daughter to a, a parent-child painting class. And so we went to that and I was just like, 
wait, wow, this place is kind of cool, but you're like 10 minutes down the road from me and, and I had no idea it even existed, you know, or anything. And then I got in there and then I saw that there were other classes offered and I thought, oh, you know, a master, I think there was like a mastery oil painting class or something. And so, or maybe it was like a portrait class because I, I, one of them I painted my grandpa. And, um, and I was like, I couldn't even oh, I remember flesh that. tones. I remember that with the farmer and <laughs> yeah. the John Deere. And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so it was just one of those, I don't know, for whatever reason, I chose that picture of him. And it it was like the only like frontal like face. Yeah. It came know, out good though. Picture. It came out good. I still have it and everything. and But it reminds me of like, wow, you really can't mix together flesh tones and you know, <laughs> things like that. Yeah. He was kind of orange. Yeah. I remember. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He was very orangey. A lizard and crimson, I think like mixed in there for some reason and orange. Yeah. yeah. And so did that class. And then I think I did an abstract class and I did another class and I heard you talking about the mastery program. And so I was like, okay, I'll go to the info meeting. And then I talked to Fred about it and he's like, well, yeah, I think if some and you really want to do, then like now's the time to do it. Like everybody's yeah. in school, like we can figure it out and work schedule wise. And your the time that you had was exact time of what I would per work perfectly and ideally for me to take the kids to school, go back or go to your class and then go back and pick them yeah. up and still continue throughout my day. And so it all just aligned well. And so I thought, yeah. okay, I can't, I would totally regret it if I didn't do it. I think that's like a huge important thing and kind of sounds like a lot of what we're talking about mm -hmm. is, you know, everybody has a purpose, everybody has a destiny, mm -hmm. and there are, and we all have desires. Mm -hmm. And then there's just a matter of like timing and it, it all fitting together. Yeah. And that moment that you, you begin to really, you know, step into that aspect mm -hmm. of your destiny. And I think like a real key from what I'm hearing you say is, to really be open, number one, to like those serendipities or mm -hmm. or what's available, what's coming to you, what's happening around you yeah. and being ready and being, you know, willing and open. It'll all happen as it should. And just kind of riding that that wave, basically. Mm -hmm. And so now here you are, you paint your abstracts, mm -hmm. you do commission work, you have collectors and you have uh, at least one gallery that I know about mm -hmm. that you're in. Yeah. What are your future plans? What are you keeping your eyes open for as the stars align and yeah. you move into what's next? What do you feel like is next? Well, nothing too uh, like out there or extra. It's more of just even realizing even more, the more time I put into it, the more things happen. So if I want X, Y, Z to happen, then what do I need to do in order to make that happen? And so putting in more time in the studio and just painting and painting and painting and then open, and then reaching out to other galleries and or maybe some artist calls. You know, I haven't really done a whole lot of that and do more local shows and within my community too. And so, and just kind of seeing what else is out there. And, you know, I'd love to show in other galleries and cities that I want to visit. What cities are, are on your radar? So I love Carmel by the Sea. And so I've, there's a gallery down there that I think my art, and the thing is, is not to just like want your art to be in just any gallery, but maybe yeah, a gallery a fit. that fits. Yeah, mm -hmm. a good fit where their collectors are, you know, pretty similar to the collectors that you're experiencing now, or maybe a little bit even collect more art maybe, or I don't know. But I think that would be a great city to be in just in California and that the Bay Area like that. And then also think of like Santa Fe, like I, I haven't been there. I would love to go there and maybe show in, in a gallery there. It would be nice to be in Chicago too, just because that's close to home and maybe some more local interest. And let's see, I've got a list in my, you know, my goals of the different cities. So I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I, I know a gallery in Santa Fe that you would fit okay. really well into. I'll tell cool. you. All right. I'll Sounds tell you good. what it is. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I want to kind of end with this question. Okay. Thinking about, you know, your journey and, and what you're experiencing in the art world right now. And because whatever it is we experience, it's just this one little prism that we see things through. So through your yeah. prism, what do you see for art in the future and for artists in the future? I see for artists in the future is taking more control of their art and not leaving it up to the well, if I get noticed or if I get seen someday, maybe mm. they'll respect my art or see it. And people aren't really reacting to your art, then maybe you're not communicating it very authentically. Or maybe it's that, you know, 
take a step back and kind of re-really evaluate what people do want to see or know or feeling. Maybe, you know, something's not aligning a, a little bit there. But I think the future is artists taking more control of showing and sharing their art, selling their artwork, expanding more nationally around the globe too and everything and having more opportunities to be able to be creative with their own art business, way they want to show, way they want to print their art, creating our own websites. You know, it's, it's up to mm-hmm. you however you want to do it. So yeah. I think they have more control in how their art is shown and, and seen and sold. You know, you do have that business finance background mm-hmm. and your husband is, you yeah. know, a very strong businessman and mm-hmm. studies businesses and yeah. does business consulting. It sounds to me like what you're saying is that in the future, artists are shifting out of this sort of identity of, well, I just create, I'm not very good Mm -hmm. at business. I'm not good at all those things. Somebody else will do that for me, whether it's the gallery or a dealer or a designer, you know, and more moving into, I'm going to create my own business Mm -hmm. and be responsible for my own business and sort of step into that role as a businesswoman, as a businessman, using art as your product. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, Obviously, we really agree with that. And that's like our whole, you know, thrust of what we're doing here with even the Light Movement show and this mm. this podcast. So yeah. is to equip artists and empower artists to really take control, like you said, of their art business and map out and plot out and and create the future that they want for themselves mm-hmm. and not just like you and we're saying, you know, just like, oh, well, if I'm ever discovered, then maybe it'll mm-hmm. happen for me. Your thoughts on sort of authenticity and vulnerability and, you know, really representing your true self in your art mm-hmm. so that there's a a market that kind of clamors around you or there's a market that comes to you that recognizes what you're putting out there in mm. that true authenticity because people today are really hungry for authentic mm-hmm. and what is true, what is authentic. Yeah, so, and connection. You know, yeah, it's a deeper definitely. connection when you are more authentic in that way. And it's so interesting how social media is such a huge part of our lives right mm-hmm. now, but it's facilitating and driving more authentic connections. Oh, definitely. Which yeah. is is so interesting and so cool mm-hmm. and very kind of almost counterintuitive. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, this has been a really interesting talk. It's been great to like allow the listeners to learn more about you and kind of hear a different perspective. You're very interesting. You're very deep and open and your artwork's beautiful. And so people can find you on Instagram, Casey Wakefield. You have a website, Mm caseywakefieldart.com. Appreciate you sharing everything and letting people get to know you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And thanks for all that you do for all of us. Appreciate it. So it's great.